Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Freebus UBI workshop. And, uh, and uh, today, um, today we have, uh, oh, I didn't, I didn't check everybody's uh, uh, name pronunciation. We have Anna Ustendorp and Johan Gutzmann uh, will be giving a joint presentation. Uh, and so I will turn it over you to begin. Right, uh, thank you, Carl. Thank you. Um, nice to meet you all. Just give me a second to start my uh, screen sharing. There you go. So just as a check, you should all see my presentation now, right? Okay, perfect. So also uh, from me and from Anna, welcome everybody. My name is Johan Gutzma, as Carl already said. And today my colleague Anna Ausnob and I are going to talk about how an unconditional cash transfer can increase political participation by building trust. More specifically, we're going to talk about a exclusive study that investigated whether receiving an unconditional cash transfer as part of unemployment benefits increases the intention to vote among long-term unemployed Finnish citizens. Furthermore, we're not going, or we're not only going to show you the findings of the study, we are also going to show you or elaborate on the mechanism or one of the psychological mechanisms that underlie this effect. But before we do so, please allow us to introduce ourselves quickly. Anna and I are both experts at the Stiftung Grundeinkommen, which is a Munich and Berlin-based think tank that explores um, the transformation of the German social system towards a more universal social system. And we do that by adopting an evidence-based um, slash evidence-informed perspective. Anna and my main areas of expertise are social psychology, psychology of motivation, and work in organizational psychology. So uh, I'm pretty sure you can tell that Anna and I are both psychologists. And psychology will also be somewhat of the focus of our presentation today. So we, of course, will be talking about the findings um, of the study, but we will also maybe even more so elaborate on the psychological mechanism that drives these effects. Um, generally, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them during the presentation. You can also save them for later because I understood that there will be time for discussion as well. Okay. So at Stiftung Grundeinkommen, we are currently, among other things, interested in exploring the potential of basic income for building and strengthening democracy, motivating civic engagement and strengthening social cohesion. And when I say, or when we say basic income, um, as a short disclaimer to begin with, we basically mean every related policy that falls under some umbrella term. We are aware of the sometimes very contentious debate about the labeling, but for us, at least, within the context of this presentation, when we say basic income, we basically mean everything that falls under this. Yeah, and we are in particular interested in the relationship between basic income or basic income related and inspired policies and political participation and especially electoral turnout. And this is because uh, political participation has been declining in Germany. It has been quite high in the 70s, but since uh, the 1980s, electoral turnout has been declining in all kinds of elections. So in parliamentary elections, but also in state elections or European elections, there's been this decline. And that by itself would not be as big as an issue, but uh, in addition, there's uh, also a socioeconomic gap in voting turnout. So this decline is especially pronounced among citizens with low socioeconomic status. And you can see that nicely in those figures. So in, in the left um, figure, you can see that the electoral turnout among people with high income, which is um, the upper gray line is much higher than the turnout of people with medium or lower income. And on the right, in the right graph, you can see that uh, people who are unemployed, that is the 
that's the, the red line at the bottom, have a much lower turnout than people who are employed or retired. And here, the difference in the end um, in 2018 is the biggest difference. It's um, more than uh, 35 percentage points, which is a lot. And we also um, find this socioeconomic gap in our own research. We looked at um, the latest elections in, in Germany, the state elections, which took place in May of this year in Schleswig-Holstein and Nordrhein-Westfalen, and we correlated uh, the turnout um, across counties in those states with the official unemployment rate and the mean income per capita in those counties. And on the left, there's uh, you can see the unemployment rate and you can see a negative correlation between turnout and unemployment rate, meaning that the higher the unemployment rate, the lower the turnout. And on the right, you can see a positive correlation between income and turnout. So the higher the income, the higher the turnout. So um, there are obviously many different reasons for this socioeconomic gap in voter turnout. One very um, big reason, very important reason is social context. We know from psychological research, but also from sociological research that uh, the voting norm among people or citizens with low SES is not particularly strong, meaning that people from the segment of society tend to not view voting as a civic duty, nor is it very common for them or their friends or acquaintances to go out and vote. So voting is just simply nothing that you would normally do in um, or among a lot of um, people with low SES. Also, we know that there's very little interest in politics, which has to do with another uh, reason for the socioeconomic gap in voter turnout, which is the feeling of being left behind, which is, I think, nicely summarized, summarized by the uh, quote, don't play if you can't win. And that illustrates the idea that, at least subjectively, a lot of people with a low socioeconomic status tend to believe that their preferences, their interests are not, um, or that the politicians um, and the political process and the political decision-making tends to neglect their preferences and interests. So for them, it feels like a rational choice not to engage with the political process because after all, the voice seemingly is not heard. Um, finally, there's also a big literature on the effects of cognitive load um, that the experience of financial strain puts on a person. So we know, again, from social psychological research that if you experience poverty, relative poverty, or even just financial worries, you, are, you have less cognitive resources at your disposal, you have less time, there are a lot of practical constraints you experience, and all these factors, all these constraints together um, do not leave much space cognitively and practically to think about politics and engage with the political process. So there are a number of reasons that account for the socioeconomic gap. But of course, um, the big question is, why should we care? After all, you know, we could just say it's simply an observation that we have. Now, the reason why the socioeconomic gap in voting turnout is so um, problematic is that the interests of citizens with low SES are underrepresented in political decision. -making. It shouldn't come as a surprise that generally speaking, political decisions are made with the voters' preferences in mind. And we know from research that preference of voters and non-voters are simply not the same. So for instance, non-voters tend to prefer redistributive policies much more strongly than voters do. And you know, if you keep in mind that a lot of non-voters are also people with low socioeconomic status, um, it's easily conceivable that the preferences of these citizens tends to be neglected in the decision-making process. And that leads to somewhat of a vicious cycle. Yeah? Um, if the preferences are neglected, that creates the feeling of being left behind, which in turn fosters withdrawal from the uh, political process, which leads to less voting turnouts and then actually the neglect of the preferences and so on and so forth. How can we reduce this gap? Um, one potential lever 
is the social security system. Because we know from uh, previous research that welfare policies can influence voting turnout. Both uh, universal and unconditional welfare policies have been found to increase turnout, possibly by signaling responsiveness and inclusion. So basically telling that um, your preferences, your interests matter to us. Also, welfare policies are the touch point with um, the target group. Uh, the social security system is the governmental institution. Citizens with low SES are most likely to interact with. And from psychological research on effective interventions, we know that interventions are then especially effective if we focus on the target group and if we focus on the underlying psychological mechanisms. Therefore, it makes a lot of sense to look at the potential of welfare policies as a means for increasing uh, voting turnout and strengthening democratic engagement. So against this background, we asked ourselves, does basic income inspired social security systems have the potential to increase political participation among citizens with low socioeconomic status? Yeah, and to explore this question further, we were very lucky um, to work with Salomon Giromaniana, who are three researchers from Munich and Finland. And the Stiftung Grundeinkommen was able to fund their research on uh, data from the Finnish basic income experiment, which was um, a government initiated um, field experiment on an unconditional cash transfer, which took place in Finland in 2017 and 18. And um, just as a short um, disclaimer, before we continue uh, talking about the data, um, Johan and I, or the Stiftung Grundeinkommen, we were not the principal investigators in the study. Um, that was Salomo, Jerum and Jana. So um, we are still very happy to talk about the data and to present them to you. But um, if, we, if you have very interest, intricate questions, and very specific questions about the mythology, we might not be able to answer them and we might have to refer to um, those, uh, to Jerum and his colleagues for that. But yeah, but I think we're fine to go for all the other questions. So continuing with the data and zooming in. The, thank you. There you go. So just a little bit background on the Finnish basic income experiment. All participants in, all participants in the experiment were unemployed at the start uh, of the experiment. The treatment group were 2000 randomly selected um, Finnish citizens who received unemployment um, benefits and um, the control group was um, also for, were also um, unemployed um, people in Finland. Um, the treatment group received um, the usual unemployment benefit, which was 560 euros, um, with the difference that they received this income without any conditions, so they didn't have to apply for a job, um, there was nothing. They, there was nothing they had to do in return for this money. And also, a second difference is that even if they started a job within the duration of the experiment, within those two years, um, this income was not reduced by their earned income. So when they started a job, they could keep both this um, the finished income as well as their earned income for the duration of those of the, for the duration of the experiment. So there are two big differences between the treatment and the control group. And now continuing, um, the researchers um, accessed the survey data um, that was collected within this experiment, within towards the end of the experiment. And in total, there were uh, almost 1,600 people that participated. Okay, so the main outcome of interest for the Finnish government was actually um, to look at effects on employment. But our main outcome of interest was to look at effects on vote intention in the upcoming elections or back then the upcoming elections. And there were other um, interesting outcomes that we looked at, um, especially trust was very interesting to us and we will talk a bit about it later on. So uh, the researchers performed a linear regression. Um, they controlled um, for several variables. And an important note is um, that uh, they conducted the analysis um, for three groups um, separately. 
um, as it is common within voting uh, literature on voting um, behavior. Um, there are three different groups of people. So those who are very unlikely to vote, those who sometimes vote and sometimes, sometimes they don't, and those who are very likely to vote all the time. So the researchers formed um, three groups based um, based on these properties and, and they, they were based on stable correlates of voting like education or age. And the effects were ex expected to be most prominent among those so-called marginal voters, because here we expect um, their behavior to be the most malleable. All right, so before I'm going to show you the results, um, again, a short disclaimer, I'm, on, I'm, I'm only going to show you the results for uh, our main outcome of interest, which was intention to vote, and for one of the other outcomes of interest, which is trust in parliament. Um, we do that just for the sake of time. If you're interested in the other results, we prepared additional slides, so feel free to ask us at the end of our presentation if you want to see the effects on internal political efficacy, stress, or interpersonal trust. So without further ado, here are the results. So we find that receiving an unconditional cash transfer increases the intention to vote um, for marginal voters by 7.3 um, percentage points, um, which is, um, if you look at the get out the vote literature, quite a decent effect size, even though at first glance it might seem, you know, rather marginal, but in fact, it's, it's pretty large. Um, as expected, we do not find any significant effects of the treatment for people with a low propensity to vote and for people with a very high propensity to vote. If you're interested in the numbers, I'll briefly zoom in. Here you can see um, the results of the regression. I'm not going to go into that, um, I'll just, you know, give you a couple of seconds to screen over that. Since in the interest of time, I'm going to continue with the second result. Um, trust in Parliament. We here see that receiving an unconditional cash transfer increases trust in Parliament um, for both people with a low propensity to vote and for marginal voters, but not for people with a high propensity to vote. Again, I quickly zoom in um, into the uh, results from the regression analyses. What's interesting here maybe is that we see that there's an overall effect of the treatment, which is um, primarily driven by people with low propensity to vote and by marginal voters, not so much by high propensity voters who seem to have a very high trust in parliament to begin with. What might be also interesting to note is that there's no difference between um, low propensity voters and marginal voters in terms of the uh, effect of the intervention. So both for low propensity voters and for marginal voters, um, the uh, basic income treatment or the unconditional cash flow treatment um, increase trust, trust comparably strongly. Sorry, um, here we go. So these are the results. Um, of course, there are a number of limitations that we want to uh, draw your attention to. First of all, intention to vote is not actual voting behavior. We are very aware of that. And we know from psychological research that there is a considerable gap between intervention, uh, between intention and behavior. Meaning that only because someone has the intention to do something does not necessarily mean that he or she is going to do it. Um, also, we see empirically that actual voter turnout is typically lower than the levels of voting intentions measured prior to any election. Yet, even though this is certainly a limitation, um, intention to vote is still a valid predictor of actual voting behavior, albeit, or albeit maybe not the strongest. What we are at liberty to say though, and that's why I just hesitated a bit because I was thinking whether we can actually say it, but I think we can. Um, our study is part of a larger study conducted by Janne, Jerome, and Salomo, um, and there they looked at actual voting behavior, at the registry data for the voting um, in Finnish elections. And even though the results have not been published yet, I think it's, it's okay for us to say that um, it looks like as if these results, the actual voting behavior results, do not contradict what we find 
with regard to intention to vote. Another limitation, of course, is that uh, the treatment was not entirely unconditional, which means that uh, people in the treatment group um, could or had to apply for other social benefits that were conditional. So within the treatment group, there were people who experienced full unconditionality and other people experienced partly in, or in partly unconditional social system. The other uh, limitation is that the treatment was not entirely means test free, meaning again, that uh, there were some job seekers who could or had to apply for benefits that were indeed means tested. So the treatment was neither fully unconditional nor entirely means test free. Uh, last limitation that we didn't put down here, but which we think warrants mentioning is that, um, as Anna already told you when she briefly talked about the uh, methodological setup of the Finnish basic income experiment, there are two potential causes for any difference between the group. One is partly unconditionality. The other one is um, the work incentive. Uh, if you remember, people in the uh, treatment group were allowed to keep the 560 euros they received unconditionally, even if they found a job within the two year period. So um, that of course is a threat to any internal validity of any experiment. So we cannot be entirely sure whether our effect on voting attention and trust is really due to unconditionality and not due to um, uh, work incentives or a combination of both. But, um, as Anna will tell you later on, I think, uh, there is a lot of evidence to believe, both from our data and from other research as well, that it's um, specifically the unconditionality that drives this effect. Okay, so to sum it up, um, we find in uh, the study that unconditional cash transfer increases the intention to vote. And we also find that unconditional cash transfer increases trust in parliament. For those of you who are somewhat familiar with uh, statistical path models, you'll see that that basically looks like a mediation um, analysis or mediation process. Um, and all it lacks basically is the, the arrow from trust in parliament to voting intention. Now, we didn't put it down here because in our data, we did not um, look at a mediation effect. Or put more precisely, um, the researchers did not look at a mediation effect, mainly because of methodological constraints in the data having to do with when the data were collected. But we know from other research that trust in parliament does increase voting intention. So there's a lot of evidence to assume that trust in parliament is indeed the mediator, the mechanism behind the effect of unconditional trust, cash transfer on political participation in general and voting intention in particular. And that's why for the remainder of this presentation, we want to focus on this mechanism. Okay, so let's take a, a little bit closer look at the topic of trust for the rest of the presentation. Um, first of all, what is trust? Trust is, um, in general, the willingness to be vulnerable to someone else's actions based on positive expectation about the other's behavior. So it has two components. The first is the vulnerab vulnerability. And the second is the positive expectations about the behavior, which means uh, not only expectation, the expectation that someone else is capable of doing something, but um, more specifically, the expectations, the expectation that someone else will act in my interest or at least will not against will not act against my interest so it's a, an expectation of goodwill and individual trust in institutions or trust in politics uh, has been is associated in general with a general general um, willingness to uh, to cooperate with authorities a general um, willingness to contribute to society. For example, it has been found that it, it correlates with willingness to pay taxes. And as we just said, it correlates with voter turnout. While political distrust um, correlates with beliefs in populist opinions and beliefs in conspiracy myths. 
and trust in other people is usually uh, usually forms an index of the share of citizens who generally trust other people. So it's often um, measured as an index of a trust climate of a country. And this trust climate of a country has been found to be um, associated with all kinds of, of positive outcomes, like freedom from corruption, better infrastructure, better education, literacy, um, health variables, economic growth. Um, yeah, all kinds of positive outcomes. So as you can see that both trust in institutions as well as a trust climate and trust in others um, are, are important for the success and also for the resilience of a society. And we know that in, in times like these today, a resilient um, society is very important when we face the challenges like the pandemic war, and uh, global warming and so forth. So trust being so important, how did the Finnish basic income policy manage to increase trust in the recipients? So as you already said, we, we don't know for certain which factor in the policy may have increased the trust, but as literature and theory suggests, it's probably the unconditionality of that policy. Because we know that in, in conditional welfare states where non-cooperative behavior is sanctioned, there's usually, it's usually associated with a, a certain arbitrariness because there's an individual person that has to make a judgment call on whether a sanction is justified or not. And there's usually more conflict and need for a, a, felt need for secrecy or for self-protection in the interaction between the recipient and the public official administering um, that sanction. And in, a, in an unconditional system, all of this is much less likely. So we, we don't have this in an unconditional um, system. And on the other hand, um, in an unconditional system, the unconditionality may signal um, a sign of responsiveness or care from the authority. So recipients might feel much more included or heard, and that might lead to a circle of, a cycle of cooperation instead of distrust. And these findings or these reasonings um, fit very well with what we know from the literature on what features of policies and institutions increase trust. So in other research, we see that anything that promotes fairness or justice in a policy or in an institution will also promote trust. For example, if it's a, um, a policy that increases um, freedom from corruption, a policy that's not arbitrary, that um, leads to equal treatment, so nobody's, uh, nobody's um, receiving any um, different treatment based on, for example, social background and so forth. Also, and especially universal uh, welfare policies have been found to increase trust, while means-tested policies decrease it, decrease it. And that is possibly also true, also due to um, the fact that universal policies are less arbitrary and more fair than means-tested policies. And thirdly, anything that makes the public official an ally instead of an opponent to the recipient uh, will increase trust. So anything that, that decreases that need for self-protection or that decreases that dog eat dog mentality um, that welfare policies often have. And finally, um, any feature of a policy that might remedy or that might um, compensate uh, inequality will probably increase trust. So anything that, that helps against inequality of opportunities, for example, will increase trust. Okay, so when we look at these features um, more from a basic income inspired lens, um, we, can, yeah, we can look at guiding features that all kinds of basic income policies and basic income inspired policies have in common. 
And we can see that there's a quite a, a lot of overlap. So usually basic income policies would also aim at reducing arbitrariness. They would try to promote equal treatment and transparency. And that's very probably would lead to a more fair and just um, policy. Also by definition or by at least many definitions of basic income include this aspect of universalism and also unconditionality, which is um, also a key uh, criterion in the definition of all basic income policies. So that would um, probably lead to more cooperation and make um, the public official uh, more of an ally instead of an opponent to the recipient. And finally, many basic income policies um, would aim at fostering equal opportunities and even aim at redistribution. So that might increase equality and thus also lead to trust. Okay, so in conclusion, in the face of the challenges that we, we face today, we need a resilient society and a resilient society is a society in which citizens are trusting and trustworthy and in which institutions are trusting and trustworthy and that has a resilient democracy as well. And as we saw today, the design of welfare policies might be a lever to promote both trust and the political participation in society. Thank you. All right, thank you both. Thank you. Uh, could you uh, uh, turn off your screen share so we can uh, the, see well the faces of all the panel members? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Now, I would like to bring on uh, our discussant, uh, Arita Domi, uh, who's going to give some initial reactions and get us going uh, on today's discussion. Arita, can you hear me? Uh, unmute and give me some video. Um, I can unmute, but for some reason it says that I cannot start the video because the host has... Okay, no. Now you can. Okay. okay. Um, hello. Uh, okay, so I have a few questions, um, but before I start, um, I just wanted to say that um, I found it interesting that you found significant results on the marginal votes, and I think um, those results are quite meaningful, and there's a lot to unpack there um, with future studies. Um, there's another thing I liked in the study, and um, you mentioned that uh, there are two income participation gaps, and one was reflecting the inequality in current income, and then another was reflecting unequal opportunities in real life and early life. And um, you also mentioned a study um, about the Native American casinos and uh, how, um, and that provided uh, some support on the long-term benefits of a basic income system, um, which um, was interesting to hear, especially with the results of the paper. Um, so starting with a couple of questions, um, I know you said uh, there's, you did not design the, the um, methods, but I had just a quick question and it's okay if, um, sure. It, it was about the, how you decided to calculate the probability of intending to vote. And I was wondering why it was this way and why not asking or surveying people if they voted um, beforehand or a, a different way? So that is a very good question. And that was one of the questions we intensively discussed um, with the researchers as well, because there are many different ways to calculate propensity scores. Um, there are different methods for these propensity scores. Um, so in short, what, what we can say, and you know, for more detailed answer, we have to refer you to the principal investigators, unfortunately. But what we can say is that um, they, they, they used the data that was collected as part of the Finnish basic income experiment. And there, they simply didn't ask do you intend to vote? Because yep. you're right, it would make a lot of sense just to simply ask how likely is it that you are going to vote in the next election? But they couldn't, so they used um, a propensity score model from the voting literature, from the get out of the vote literature um, in, in order to calculate 
who is the marginal voter, who is a low propensity voter and a high propensity voter. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, um, I can move on with my second question, um, if that's okay. And um, this was more about the, the marginal voters. Um, and in, at one point, um, you say that uh, these voters are more willing to vote in, in important elections, but they're not, they're not voting in uh, municipality elections or um, smaller elections. And I was wondering how your result plays with th this definition, or are there other factors of marginal voters that is making them have these significant results other than this? And if they're voting more, are they voting more on municipality elections, or is it just an increase in proportion of how much they vote in, in more bigger elections? Um. Well, it's for sure that usually the turnout is slower on municipal elections than parliamentary elections. And we know that in, for example, in parliamentary elections, much more people vote. So that would be one factor um, in that. So probably the marginal voters might vote at parliamentary elections too, but they might not vote at other kinds of elections, but it's also other um, factors like age, anything that we know that um, has to do with the likelihood to vote. Um, if I may add. Um, sure. So the, your decision to vote is influenced by a lot of factors. Um, one, for instance, being trust in parliament, other being just your background, um, but also whether sort of the, the issues that are being um, discussed matter to you or not. So to your question, um, and that's just my gut feeling, so I'm not speaking for the authors of the, of the paper here, I'm just, you know, from my reading of the paper and my understanding of the literature, I'd say that you probably see the increase, um, especially in elections that are important to those uh, marginal voters. Um, you'd probably see it more pronounced there than if there's an election which is not um, so important to them or to the issues they are concerned about. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. And, and um, it would be a, a good addition to the literature if it could be explored further, because I think it's an important result to um, if it's increasing votes in the parliamentary elections. Yeah. Okay. I okay. can. Oh, um. Uh, it sounded like you were done, Ariz. Do you have more? Because I, I have something. I have something that I wanted to say. If you. Uh, um, but you have more? Yeah, I have one more question, if that's okay. Okay, go on. Okay, um, I just, uh, just one sentence at the end that says that this could be more replicable and more established democracies. Um, do you have anything to add on that, on why only established democracies or? Um... Um, so I'm, I'm not sure which sentence, but I, I can say something about the effects on established dem democracy versus uh, newer democracy. So all, all these effects like on trust and on turnout, all these effects that we know in literature usually are, are from more stable democracy. So they might be different in, in newer uh, democracies and also in, in other kinds of regimes like autocratic regimes, anything like that. The results of the findings might be a bit different in those. Okay, I would like to sort of react, uh, react here more than question. Is this? I think this is like uh, a, a, a lesson for people who are interested in basic income and uh, and aren't always interested in in, in statistics. Because this is this something that it sounds like such a small, tedious little study. Oh, did they vote more in Finland? But actually. 
you ask that little question and you get these enormous implications of this question is that uh, we're just looking at the correlation of, of, of UBI and voting, but being able to interpret this about trust in my fellow citizens and in the government of the society that I live in. Uh, and this really hits me because this is really the exact type of thing that my philosophy predicts, that we spend so much time trying to get the less privileged to prove to us that they're worthy of our help, that they need to jump through this hoop and that hoop and the other hoop to earn our trust, and then we will help them. And, and the way they earn our trust is typically to work for us. Oh, you underprivileged person, get a job and work for a more privileged person. Then we will trust you. Then we'll know you're a good person. Then, oh, we will surely help you. But, but often uh, in countries where we do that, we actually help uh, the less advantaged less. And when you do this, you create a culture of distrust. We think about well, what do they have to do to earn our trust, and we never think of what do we have to do to earn their trust. But of course, if you have a society that is divided into the privileged and the, those with very little privilege or, and, and distinctly out groups, it is the people with privilege who really need to earn the trust of the others. If you want to build a trusting society, it it, it, it begins by, by those who have privilege earning the trust of those who have the least. And this, I believe, is most effectively done with unconditional aid to the people who need it the most. Um, and I think uh, Finland, uh, Finland and countries like Finland are already farther in that direction than a lot of other countries, but this shows that they've got, they've got further to go. Uh, that's not a question, uh, but that's just my reaction. Maybe you two would like to react to my reaction. Yeah, I think it's very true to be trusted. You need to prove that you're trustworthy. So that's that's just so linked. Trust and tr trustworthiness can really not be separated out at all. So yeah, I think this is the most important um, most important component of trust is to create a trustworthiness. So I and it's also like fostering a trusting society. Uh, you foster a trust society by we start out by trusting you. Whereas uh, where I live, we live in such a very suspicious society. Um, and, and, and it's a climate of, of, of fear and anger, I think, it, it, it is what it fosters. Yeah, I think it rings very true what you're saying, um, especially if you just look um, through a sort of various sort of impartial lens on the mechanisms underlying that. What we see is that people with low SES disengage from politics because they feel that their preferences are not um, considered well enough. And they do feel that in part, as the data shows and other research shows as well, because they um, feel that they're distrusted, they feel that they have to jump through all the hoops to show that. And they don't feel that we as a society, the, um, the social institutions that we have are responsive to their needs. So just simply from a practical point of view, um, I think it makes a lot of sense to first ask how can we increase their trust in us in the societal institution, other than asking how can they increase our trust in them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it's great to see some evidence that that well uh, that what I've suspected here is actually is actually true that that UBI fosters trust. So I think it's it's a really it's it, it's a result that that uh, is much bigger than it sounds. You're like well we're going to look at voting uh, UBI and voting sounds so small. Uh, now I do have we have two audiences here. We have one audience of the, the, the Freebus team, the, the Freiburg Institute for Basic Income Studies, our, our local team uh, in Freiburg uh, is on Zoom and they can ask questions out loud, uh, such as Arita. But we also have another audience on YouTube uh, who don't have the same ability to interact, but, but they're leaving comments. And I do have a question in the YouTube comment that I think is a little bit of a tangent 
a little bit tangential to this research, but let's go to it anyway. And I'll, I, uh, it's also, when people are writing comments, they're usually writing very, just very quickly, so it might need some interpretation. There's two questions here. This is from uh, Sham Sadin Amanov. Sham Sadin Amanov, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which I'm sure I'm not. Uh, and the question is, two questions here. How to deal with insincere promises regarding income regarding basic income by political parties to gain more votes. Then the second sentence is, is the independent basic income institution a solution? So now the first question, yeah, I don't know if my interpretation of these questions is anybody, but the first one about, uh, about um, insincere promises is, uh, could be two things. Uh, one could be that politicians will say, I'm going to introduce basic income in order to get votes, or I'm going to introduce basic income in order to get votes and then not do it. But another thing could be that some things like this, some things like, well, a lot of people are talking about basic income. I, it's very expensive to introduce a basic income. I'll just give them this little experiment instead. We'll do this experiment instead of, of uh, introducing basic income. And all the people who support basic income should vote for me just because I, I, I had this little cheap experiment. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what is meant. Then the second question, is the independent basic income institution a solution? Uh, well, they have, they have something like this in Alaska and Norway where money goes into a fund and then is distributed directly to the people and it is monitored on an independent basis and there's a limited amount that politicians can change it on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, in Norway, that's used just for pensions, but the pensions actually work similar to a basic income once you reach a certain age. Whereas in, in Alaska, it works more like uh, a basic income, but it's also much lower. Uh, so it, you get everybody in the cold state if, if they prove they're a resident gets it. I think he's talking, the question here is talking about things like this, but how do you answer those two questions? Well, um, I, I have to cop out a bit, unfortunately, because yeah. I'm no politician. I'm mm -hmm. first and foremost a psychologist and scientist who is um, not that invested in the political dimension of basic income. I'm much more interested in the uh, scientific dimension of basic income and mm -hmm. the effects on behavior and attitudes of citizens and society in general. Um, so. What I say is that um, what politicians do and say is, you know, powering moves. They do that to build coalitions, to get votes. Um, but I think that um, one way to deal with false promises, maybe, or grandiose promises by politicians is to have a, um, a Recipitory of evidence-based information about basic income. What can basic income do? What can't it do? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and what is maybe also politically possible within um, a given society, within a given political system with the different power dynamics at play? So that would help for the first part. And the second part, I think, um, why not? Yeah, it might make sense to have an independent body governing um, a fund distributed as a basic income, maybe also an independent body um, governing research efforts into mm -hmm. basic income as well. Mm -hmm. I, okay. I think I would add to the second part that still the government or the authorities would have to be a trustworthy entity. So it, it, it can't be an excuse to just do the basic income somehow else and then still have, have conditional and have arbitrary welfare policies by, by the state or by the government, I would say. I think it's a, it's a, big, it's a big sign of responsiveness and care if the government gives out the basic in, income or whatever similar policy. Yeah, um, I think, um, I, I think one, one 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 lesson is is that is that progressive policies and, and greater democracy go hand in hand, and it's the causality is in both directions. Uh, you find that the you find that the most democratic countries are also the countries that have the most equal outcomes 
in term in terms of wealth and income. And 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 a lot of that is driven by policy, and a lot of it is driven by is driven by other things. If somebody offers you, oh, make me an authoritarian, and then I'm going to have all sorts of distributed programs that are going to help you out. Uh, do not trust that person. Uh, and uh, and I think the more responsive the government is to the needs of the people, including the people who are the most marginalized, the more likely it is to move in the direction of things like like UBI. And I think the Nordic countries, uh, their experience, they're not at UBI yet, but they're uh, so much far ahead of other of, of other countries, um, both in terms of democracy and this. I think it's helpful. Okay, now I have another comment that I have not read in advance. This comes from Sarah Constantino. Uh, she says in the chat, she says, um, thank you for the talk. I found it very interesting. I have seen the competing hypothesis that a basic income would decrease political engagement as it might decrease interaction with the state. This may not have been the case in the, in the Finnish case. And as you point out, uh, it likely depends on what interaction is likely to begin with. In light of this, it was interesting to see your results. I unfortunately have to run. Okay, uh, so it's not so much a question, but it is something to react to. Um, how rep rep reproducible do you think these results are going to be across uh, across a lot of other countries? And is there is there you know, the the idea that basic income could cause us to become apathetic and 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 just retreat? I've got my stuff. Uh, I've got my stuff. Um, how realistic do you find that? Well, I, I know that there's these, um, I know of two competing views on voting turnout, that there's mm -hmm. this other view that turnout might decrease when people are just happy and satisfied with anything and there would be just no need to go to an election because there's no need to change anything. And that actually turnout would increase when there's some pre pressing issues um, for the people. Um, as the researchers on our paper have explained to me is that this competing view is not like, usually it's the other way around. So usually it's more that in a, in a working successful democracy, people usually tend to, the turnout tends to be higher. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is what I remember from from what they explained to me, well, we are not political scientists, so. Mm -hmm. as to okay, Johan, uh, you look like you want to get in there. <laughs> no, just as to the replicability of the findings, that's always difficult to say, um, especially if you look at cross-cultural comparisons, um, that makes it problematic anyways. Um, there will be um, a paper by the principal investigators looking at the registry data. I mean, it's still in Finland, it's the, it's the same participants, but it's a different dependent variable. Um, and as I've indicated, maybe the results go in the same direction. So that would be sort of, that would reproduce. Um, and to, to the comment, I think that, uh, it really depends, as the commentator already said herself, um, that uh, what, what's the, the baseline interaction like. So if you interact with the state or with social institutions and this interaction is primarily negative, you would expect withdrawal, right? I mean, that makes a lot of psychological sense. Mm -hmm. Now, if the interaction is very charitable, um, you find it very positive, Decreasing this positive interaction might, you know, decrease your willingness to engage with the um, political system at large. But uh, seeing that trust is a um, multiple rounds game, I would say again, my gut feeling from from the literature I know on trust um, that that wouldn't be so much of an issue because trust is something that builds over time, and um, you know, once it's there, it usually stays up. So even if you then decrease the amount of interactions you have with the state, you probably have the effects of trust at least on um, voting attention, for instance. Yeah, of course. Now, also, I need to point out that the, the number of people who vote is sometimes an indication of trust, but sometimes the indication of the, the very opposite. Um, yeah. I live Northern Ireland, during the height of the troubles in Northern Ireland, 
had some of the highest voter turnout in the world for any country that did not have mandatory voting. Uh, and there they were not voting. <laughs> it was not any sign of trust in the system. It was uh, they were voting out of, uh, out of uh, hatred and distrust for the other side. So everybody on one side felt, mm. felt uh, a, comp a compulsion to get out there and, and represent our side. And we've had some of that in the United States. As trust has gone down, between as the two parties have polarized and trust of a one, the one party by the other has gone down, actually voter participation has gone up. We've seen record high turnout. I think it was in 2016 when we had the highest turnout. Um, whereas if you look 20 years before that in 1996, when you had Bob Dole run against Bill Clinton, you're like, well, how different are these two candidates? A lot of people didn't bother. So so sometimes trust will get you out there to participate, and sometimes mistrust will get you out there to participate. And so the complexity of building an economy where people believe that, that their participation is going to have an effect, and they want to participate for the right reason, um, that's, actually, that's actually very difficult and, and very difficult and challenging. And it has to do with not just are we counting the votes fairly? But do we have a bunch of groups that are trying to work with each other um, and, and that, that trust that, that, well, we're going to count the votes and then, and then we're going to go with, with what the majority says? Yeah. Just maybe as, as a last remark to what you say, just to, to be very clear, of course, we're not saying that trust is the only motivator to go out and vote. There are many other motivating factors as well. And sometimes it's contentious political issues that Trump uh, um, uh, trust. The way we think about um, trust, it's more of a context factor. So it's, it's bad for a society if there are very low levels of trust. Um, it's better for a society to have high levels of trust. But once you have like relatively high levels of trust, other issues might become more salient in getting you to go out and vote, other than just simply thinking that your government is responsive to your needs. OK, thank you both. We've already gone uh, uh, two or three minutes over time. So I uh, will have to cut it short here. Great talking to you both. Thanks for these this really interesting results that you found here. And uh, I hope we'll get you involved in future discussions with, with the previous workshop. Thank you. Thank you very uh, talk much. To all so now, talk to you all later. And we'll now, we'll take a seven minute break before Jamie Cook of the Royal Society of the Arts in Scotland will come up and talk about uh, how basic income is going on in Scotland. So uh, we'll see you all here at, um, at 5.05 Central European time. Jamie, are you there? I am indeed, tell you didn't, sir. Okay, I can hear you fine. Uh, can, you, can we experiment with your video? Turn your video on. Yep. There you go, it should be on. I can't see myself, but can you see me? I cannot. Oh, I think it's the screen sharing probably. Yeah, it's, I think it might have something to do with that. Let's see, I'm gonna go up here to view. Let's see, I'll try show non-video participants. Let's see gallery okay there you are now i can see you now let's see if i can put a spotlight on you add spotlight okay i put a spotlight on you now we'll be able to see you um now let's see there's my video uh, now you can see me i can see you um okay now um let's see um um, um let's see um are you going to be sharing your screen at all no, I was just planning to talk, so I've not got okay. any really strength, and so it should be nice and easy, hopefully. Great. Okay, so we've we've sound and video checked all we need to. Um, so uh, so we've got uh, five more minutes of break before you start talking. So I will talk to you in five minutes. Brilliant. Thanks, Carol.
Oh, Jamie, before we start, you there? I am indeed. Okay, uh, before we start, I just want you to know, um, we don't have to be as strict with the stopping time for you um, as we do, as we did for the last team, uh, because there's no one coming next. So if we go over, we go over 10 or 15 minutes, that's really not, not a big problem. We don't have to, of course, but yeah, yeah no, that's, that's something. I, I need to yeah. be finished by quarter past, if that's okay, just because um, I've got to say something. Okay, oh, I'm, I'm, I need to interrupt it because uh, I need to leave like on point, like uh, <laughs> shortly after six o'clock. So I need to close the Zoom room. Okay. Oh, so okay. I'm sorry, Jamie. No, no, that's fine. I, I'm okay. not going to talk for too long anyway. I'd rather you face conversation. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. All right, well, um, let's get started again. Um, and do I need to wait the 20, the count of, and is it a count of 20 or is it actually 20? No, 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 you can, you can just talk, we are still alive. We're still alive, okay, so let's see, is it time to go? Yes, it is time to start, okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second half of today's Freebus Universal Basic Income Workshop Series. Um, our, our speaker for this half of the session is Jamie Cook of the Royal Society of Arts in Scotland, one of the leading think tanks uh, in the UK. And Jamie is here today to talk about, um, about the, the, what's been going on with the basic income movement and the prospects or the uh, prospect or lack thereof of a basic income experiment in uh, Scotland. Oh, go ahead, Jamie. Thanks, Carol. It's uh, fantastic to, to join you and everyone else. Um, and actually, hopefully, uh, this can build on the fantastic presentation we just uh, had. I think um, there's a lot I really want to follow up with Anna and Johan about their work. So I think it adds a, a depth and a, and a data and a research to some of the things we've been talking about here in Scotland, the UK and elsewhere that I think is, is really important. Um, and I suppose I'm approaching the discussion today from more of a policy perspective. So I, I'm not an academic. For me, it's about how we've seen the, the movement, the discussion around basic income develop and grow in Scotland uh, and other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, where perhaps some of the opportunities um, lie ahead of us in terms of trying to take that forward, as well as obviously the, the barriers. Uh, and I'm actually really interested to, to open up to the, the people watching and, and uh, participating today to really start to explore from our broader experiences, perhaps what has been working in terms of bringing decision makers, community groups, um, academics, business leaders on board with the idea. Because obviously basic income, as we know, globally has had a massive increase in relevance and interest and support uh, over recent years. But clearly, uh, you know, as we touched on the last presentation, some countries, some areas are maybe slightly further ahead with the discussion or slightly more uh, politically feasible. And so I think it'd be interesting from, from my perspective to open up and, and see where we can learn from our experiences in different parts of the world. So as I say, I'm, I'm gonna run through just very quickly, I kind of potted history of the, the basic income discussion in Scotland and where we've got to. Uh, maybe a re-reflection on, on how we got there and some of those key characteristics, because I think there's some interesting learning from a policy and, and uh, activism perspective. Uh, and then really where we are now, the implications of some of the decisions being made in the United Kingdom and what might come next. And, and hopefully that can give us a useful reflection on the space that Scotland offers just now. So basic income in Scotland as a concept uh, has been around for, for a while, as in other parts of the world, uh, and yet never was really a mainstream political concept. Out of our main political parties in Scotland, really only for a long time, the Scottish Green Party were active supporters. Other parties had been interested at different points, but never as an active campaigning topic. There had been interest from uh, certain parts of academia, uh, particularly amongst economists. So uh, Annie Miller, who's a, a long established uh, member of BN and, and many other parts of the basic income movement in Scotland. Uh, and the late Ailsa Mackay, who was a leading Scottish uh, economist who was a big supporter and proponent of basic income, particularly from the viewpoint of uh, feminist economics. Uh, and yet, as I say, it very much hadn't been that mainstream discussion. Uh, my organisation got involved in, in the conversation right about the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, with our first report. Uh, but I must admit, hands up, uh, I didn't see it as a, 
a realistic uh, active policy at that point. For me, it was a chance to reflect upon the failings in the United Kingdom social security system to be a provocation around different ways of doing things. And I'll come back to where some of those provocations perhaps were relevant. But what's been really striking in Scotland has been the speed with which that debate and that discussion has moved from not even being a consideration within policy circles to being at the very heart of governmental and wider party political uh, and civil service and civil society discussions. Uh, you know, to go from 2016, uh, where it has no real conceptualization or support, to now in Scotland, where uh, we had our most recent elections had four out of our five main political parties, including the governing party, the Scottish National Party, uh, express support for basic income as a policy, where we've had money put into feasibility studies for experimentation. Uh, and where we're looking and still have a Scottish government that holds up basic income as their long term policy goal for Scotland. It's a remarkable and speedy transition. And whilst, yes, Scotland will have its own unique set of factors, I think shows that there can be some interesting learning points from us. I think one of the key characteristics uh, of that speed of transition has been the nature of where the momentum for basic income has come from in Scotland. It hasn't been from national political parties or national politicians. Whilst they're now on board and clearly have a critical role in terms of turning ideas into actual real life policy, the drives for basic income very much came through civic society, from community groups, from think tanks, from research organisations, from anti-poverty groups working in different parts of Scotland. It came through the wider academic community in Scotland starting to explore how as a policy it might contribute to some of the wider policy agenda areas in Scotland. And where it did have a, a degree of political involvement, it tended to be from local governments. So the most evolved level of government in Scotland are our local authorities, whether that be the cities like Glasgow and Edinburgh or other parts of the country, Fife, North Ayrshire and other um, regional bodies. They were the ones who drove that initial discussion. And I think there were several key components of that. One was a reflection that Scotland has a broadly um, centre-left, social democratic political environment. Uh, whilst we have uh, a Conservative Party, you know, traditionally there's always been a strong Conservative movement uh, in certain ways, albeit not a strong Conservative Party in Scotland. Uh, traditionally, our political parties have tended to sit on the centre-left. And what that has seen, I suppose, in many ways, is uh, decades of, of very well-meaning and well-intentioned policies, but which have perhaps been quite similar in nature and in intention. And yet some of our, our most entrenched problems in Scotland, particularly when you look at a, a city like Glasgow, our largest city, uh, have been there decade in, decade out, even with that well-meaning progressive open space for change. And I think there was a recognition from community groups, from uh, a lot of civic society, that repeating the same ideas over and over again couldn't work. We needed something different. We needed that resetting of the social contract. And so a basic income offers a combination of a, a, a progressive and a big change to how that social contract functions, whilst also recognizing the role for other policies of feeding into it. I think that was an important first starting point, that need for new approaches. I think there was a recognition and a, a, a anger and a response to the nature that social security had taken on in the United Kingdom. Now, for those who aren't aware, uh, Scotland uh, is still part of the United Kingdom, its constituent parts. So certain policies are controlled from the UK government uh, and Parliament in Westminster and London, and others are devolved to the constituent nations, to Wales, to Scotland uh, and to Northern Ireland. Now, Social Security until very recently was almost exclusively controlled on a UK wide level. We are now seeing uh, a significant transfer of powers to Scotland. But this meant that actually the Social Security system, universal credit, uh, in the United Kingdom was very much run by the UK government uh, along UK government policies. And we've seen quite a divergence in recent years between the approaches of the conservative led UK government uh, in London and many of the political uh, decisions or ideas being taken in Scotland, not just by the governing party, but also by opposition parties as well. And so this idea that what we talked about in the UK is the post-war consensus that post Second World War approach to social security and welfare, the built out of the beverage report responded to the giants that William Beveridge had identified, and actually uh, largely had cross party support for certain safety net aspects, the National Health Service, the approach to a, a welfare state that supported everyone when in need. Uh, had had been supported for, for several decades, but saw significant change undermining evolution 
from the 80s onwards, as we saw different political uh, ideologies come to the forefront. And I think that had changed the nature of the social contract in a way that had never really been put to voters. Uh, it's very interesting, you know, that, that last discussion there around trust uh, and, and the impact that that can have on political participation. I think probably in some ways we had seen the impact the lack of trust can have towards apathy, towards that feeling of disconnect, that the system changes regardless of your involvement, which isn't helped by the UK's uh, voting system. Uh, and so we'd seen a, a, a feeling that actually Social Security had moved to very much a punitive system. So although universal credit, the system we have in place now, is intended to be a universal system of a single payment, which in some ways people would argue would be a step towards a basic income, the political decision was made to, to use a lot of sanctions, punishments, of ways of forcing people to prove, as we just discussed in that last session, and Carl uh, highlighted that jumping through hoops, that presumption that people must be trying to cheat the system. This was a radical shift in terms of our conceptualization of social security. And so in Scotland, there had certainly been a pushback uh, within the population, within the political sphere of this not chiming with perhaps how we wanted to function our social security as a country, yet not having that control. Basic income seeming to offer a chance to reset and come back from that. And I think coupled to it, the, the wider challenges around that feeling of the growth of, uh, the growth of populism, the challenges of insecurity in society and the economy that we have seen all of these laid a very strong situation where basic income could start to ask the questions that Scotland needed to ask and actually more and more start to pick up some of the answers. And this led to, uh, in 2017, the Scottish Government uh, putting aside money in its programme for government, its annual legislative programme, to support a large scale uh, feasibility study into the idea of carrying out a, a basic income experiment in Scotland. Now, this would have been a significant experiment had it been carried out. 17,000 participants across Scotland receiving basic income at two different levels with a control group um, uh, allowing us to compare and contrast those. Uh, and that feasibility study, which was an incredibly important piece of work, uh, although I'll come back to in a minute why I, I feel it's not the step that we want to see next in terms of that experimentation, um, took place over the following few years, really kicking off in 2018 uh, and reporting back uh, in 2020. And of course, in that time, the significant change that we saw was the arrival and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, first and foremost, that's been a human tragedy in terms of loss of life and impact on people's health and well-being. But also in Scotland, as in many countries, it has really shifted the debate, the discussion, the understanding of the systems that we have in place. It highlighted uh, in the United Kingdom, many of the failings of the universal credit system that we already knew were in place. It, it struggles to try and respond to people quickly when the punitive approach is to restrict access to the, that support. It's inability to support self-employed people who maybe had fallen through the cracks. And indeed the fact that suddenly more people had to come in contact with social security than had done before, showing up some of the, the myths that have been portrayed through the media and political circles of these scroungers, of these poor people stealing money from within the system to actually show that it was low levels, it was low uh, levels of support and that it wasn't effective. And it shifted that dynamic to say, had we had a basic income in place entering that pandemic, Scotland and the United Kingdom would have been in a very different position. And even though UK governments uh, didn't choose to go down the route of introducing even an emergency basic income, for the pandemic, they did still revert to using money, using opportunities to supplement people's income, recognising that role and need for income as a, a key changing part of people's lives. And in Scotland, what it saw was a significant shift in support and interest from, for basic income, moving from a nice experimental concept, one of those ones that Carol mentioned a minute ago of, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to support some experimentation because it looks progressive and, you know, we, we don't need to worry about the outcomes for years, to active support and interest in delivering it as a policy. Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland, described basic income on several occasions publicly as the, an idea whose time had come that she would introduce for Scotland if she could, because it responded to the challenges of the pandemic the challenges of insecurity that we see to, uh, spreading across society and can prepare a fairer, more equitable society in Scotland for moving forward. Now, she doesn't possess the powers as it stands within the devolved context for Scotland within the United Kingdom, but it was a significant shift in terms of interest and support. It opened up that idea whereby actually this was a policy to work towards rather than a nice idea to discuss. 
And it led to the situation after the most recent Scottish parliamentary elections last year, where, as I mentioned earlier, four out of five political parties in Scotland, main political parties, are now actively supporting a basic income in some shape or form, with even the one that was opposed, the Conservative Party, much more willing to engage and discuss the idea as a potential solution to some of the challenges we face. And also saw the, the Scottish Government, the Scottish National Party in power, uh, committing to the idea of basic income as a long-term goal for Scotland, and in the meantime, exploring the idea of a minimum income guarantee as something that could be delivered under the Scottish system as it stands and the powers that we control or will control uh, in future. And that's led us to a really interesting space. One where on one hand, we're in an incredibly exciting opportunity. We see that there is political support. We're seeing that political support and interest spread to other parts of the United Kingdom. So whilst for a while, Scotland was the outlier, the, the place where basic income was, was soaring ahead in interest and yet England and other parts of the UK were struggling to follow. We've now recently had the Welsh First Minister, Mark Drakeford of the Labour Party in Wales, uh, confirm and, and looking forward to, to starting shortly an experiment looking at direct cash payments to young people leaving the care system, where there's discussions and work underway in Northern Ireland to explore what basic income could look like there, and where many English cities, particularly in the north of England, uh, have pushed for active trials or opportunities to explore basic income in their areas that they're responsible for. A significant shift in drive. So on one hand, yes, a huge opportunity and a chance for us to see how we take that forward, but also the challenges. How do you reconcile that in a time as we start to hopefully move out of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, where the challenges around previous austerity policies uh, in the United Kingdom and in Scotland start to come back to the forefront, where the challenge of money and what we can afford to pay for is seen as a significant one. I think basic income in Scotland uh, sits in several really strong positions. Uh, one is the fact that we do not and never have done, as, as our colleagues in the basic income movement across the world do, uh, I have never done. We position basic income as a foundation. It's not some sort of ideological, magical, utopian silver bullet that solves every problem. It's a foundation. It's a re reaffirming, reimagining of the social contract for the 21st century that other policies and opportunities can be built on top of. And that has allowed us to build a multi-party approach to this that just isn't just bound to the political left or the political right, but actually is seen to offer opportunities for engagement uh, across the political spectrum and also to engage with other areas of interest that are developing. So in Scotland, for example, we've been looking at the well-being economy, donut economics from Kate, Wor Kate Rayworth and her team, the idea of community wealth building or the four-day working week, starting to build a jigsaw of different policy areas. And I think I'd be really interested from uh, people participating tonight to see whether any of that kind of jigsaw building with basic income at its base is happening in other contexts um, as well. I think interestingly in Scotland, we have seen basic income very much um, become quite deeply connected into the debate around potential independence for Scotland. So the Scottish Government have recently recommitted to attempting to hold a second referendum on Scottish independence. Uh, and the, the strong chance that a basic income would be held up as a goal, as an intention for an independent Scotland, as that foundation to a newly independent country. But at the same time, we've been very key, quick and keen to make sure that it is not a constitutional issue. Yes, an independent Scotland would be able to make choices over some of its uh, approaches that it can't currently do under the current devolution system in the UK. But a United Kingdom that chose to devolve more around the economy, finances, taxation and social security to Scotland and to Wales and Northern Ireland could allow spaces for those countries to explore an idea of a basic income. So it's a chance again to move beyond everything in Scotland being simply a binary are you pro-independence or anti-independence? To one where we can see this as a policy that can be an answer, a question to both sides. How would you deliver a basic income in your preferred constitutional outcome? I think it's a really interesting chance for us in Scotland to keep connected into that global conversation. We were lucky to have the uh, BN World Basic Income Congress in Glasgow last year. Sadly, it was online uh, rather than being able to welcome everyone to the great city of Glasgow. Uh, but what that meant was we were able to engage with a much bigger audience than we would have done in person. We were able to record all our sessions and make them available for people to use afterwards. And it was a chance for Scotland to both see itself as trying to be at the forefront of discussion, but also part of a bigger global movement, a bigger global discussion around what we should be looking for in our economies and societies of the 21st century. And I think that gives us a fantastic chance to connect with organizations like Phoebus, yeah, and many of the others doing fantastic work around basic income and use that learning to test and to evaluate and bring that forward in Scotland 
alongside other places. And I think that's a really exciting opportunity for us. In terms of next steps in Scotland, I think there's a big debate around the role of experimentation. Again, much as we touched on in that last discussion, I personally don't feel that the large scale type of experiment that was highlighted in the feasibility study, so that 17,000 people receiving a basic income, A, would ever have been achievable. Uh, it would have required UK government's involvement, which was highly unlikely to happen. But I also don't think at this stage would be desirable in a Scottish context. I think that's large scale type of experimentation for Scotland would not necessarily give us any new answers. I think it would delay progression. I think it would take us down different routes and utilize money and energy that we put into other places. And not everyone in the basic income movement in Scotland would agree with that, but I think we have a lot of the evidence and the data from around the world that what we're needing is less of that large scale impact measurement and more about the impact on people, the stories that can be collected, the, the uh, a way that we can start to see a basic income have an impact on people's lives. And that, I think, can be tested on much smaller scales and can also offer that space for testing across different areas. So as Wales looks to try and introduce or, or to bring forward its, its experiment, not specifically on a basic income, obviously, as we know, basic income is always restricted in terms of how it can't be tested really in, a, in an experimental setting, but in a direct cash payment to young people leaving the care system. One idea that we've been discussing in Scotland for some time is to carry out a simultaneous or, or complementary exercise in Scotland with the same target group, which would allow us to compare and contrast what was found in Wales, the impact on young people's lives, with what could be found in Scotland, and indeed in other parts of the world that have tried as well, such as Santa Clara and California. So I think that storytelling is a critical aspect. I really was taken in, in Anna and Johan's presentation about that role of not just recognising that basic income is a chance to restore trust. I often talk about one of the reasons I support basic income is that unconditionality, that it's fundamentally us saying to our fellow residents in our country that we trust you, we believe in you, society trusts you to make your choices. But actually that flip side of it actually being a, a policy and a tool for reaffirming, for re-strengthening our social connections, our democratic con uh, connections, uh, and in fact, our democracy more generally. I think there's a really powerful framing that I hadn't quite caught or grasped in that way before, that using some of that evidence that, that Anna and Johan touched about, I think could be a really powerful contribution here. As we look to try and find new ways of engaging the population uh, moving forward, that actually providing that security of a basic income would allow us to start to strengthen those democratic and social conventions. I think that's a really powerful space for us to explore. Uh, and also seeing how we can start to look at some of the incremental or, or step by step changes. So I mentioned uh, just to kind of close out that in Scotland, we, the Scottish Government is committed to basic income as a long term policy goal. But in the meantime, is, is looking to explore a minimum income guarantee, so a minimum income that nobody should be able to fall beneath. Now, uh, instinctively, I, I have my reservations about the minimum income guarantee. I think it still tends to be quite targeted. It has it loses out in the, the importance of the unconditionality and the, the universality of a basic income. However, in a Scottish context, and I think this changes uh, depending on which political context we're in, it offers us a chance to both be doing something practical now that takes us another step along the way towards a basic income, whilst not losing the long-term goal and objective. And I think that's an important balancing act. It would have been easy for the Scottish government and others to come out and say, yes, we're going to support a basic income, we can't do anything about it, so we'll come back in 10 years and see if we can then. Or it would be very easy for them to focus then on the smaller scale changes that can be delivered, but losing the bigger goal. And I think at least the stated intention to try and make the two of those happen together uh, is a very important one. And I think crucially, it comes back to what I said drove basic income in Scotland in the first place. It's that drive from communities, from the voluntary sector, from business, from civic society, from academia, from local government. It brings the national politicians with us that allows us to not be bogged down solely in the party politics that can otherwise derail much of policy development and implementation. If we can continue to harness that combination of rigorous academic research and data with the passion of community activism and the policy shaping that think tanks and others bring towards it, then I think Scotland does offer us a really exciting place to try to take this forward. It's not guaranteed it'll happen, uh, but I think at the very least, it's asking us the questions as a nation of how we want to do this, how we want to function in the 21st century, and hopefully from learning from many of the others that we've heard from today, 
uh, and elsewhere around the world, we can use Scotland as that opportunity to really start to put the policy into place. So that's my very rapid overview of where we are just now in Scotland and the United Kingdom. I hope it offers a space for us to start to explore either how we can bring ideas from the rest of the world into driving real change here in Scotland, or indeed how we in Scotland can support those of you working around basic income and supported areas uh, across the rest of the globe. So I'm really interested to see the ideas and reflections that everybody has to share just now. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, uh, Arita, do you want to go first or shall I? Um, sure. I can go okay. first. Okay, go ahead. Um, I just had a couple of thoughts. Um, one was you touched a little bit on the um, economic implications of, of now uh, implementing um, a basic income. And I'm wondering how do you think the the uh, difficulties we're having now after the pandemic. I know you mentioned during the pandemic, the experiment was not uh, able to, you know, uh, be implemented because of the pandemic. But what about the difficulties we're, we're having now in terms of the spoken recession and the problems? How do you think these will affect the actual implementation of the policy? So I think uh, it could go in different ways. And I think this is where there needs to be some active engagement with policymakers and, and other people. We published a report in 2017 that laid out uh, a basic income that could be implemented in Scotland and uh, quite a low level basic income at that stage, kind of mapping the current benefits level in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and yet actually the economic modeling within that suggested that even a low level of a basic income in Scotland, which was achievable financially within our, yes. our current budgeting, uh, could eliminate destitution entirely and have a significant impact on poverty levels. So I think it's about the questions of where we start to, to see this. There is no doubting that the, the language around recession and challenge of austerity and others and the impacts of, of global events will be a significant one. Uh, on the same token, the conceptualization that suddenly radical change is possible has been opened up by the pandemic. Suddenly we had governments who were supposedly strongly opposed to spending money, finding money that they were able to, to spend. And I think whilst we can't be naive and pretend that that will stick forever in terms of people's ideas, I think it's changed the discussion and shown that there is a possibility to respond. So if we can do that in emergency, could it be even more beneficial to do that ahead of a, a future crisis or challenge that we might face? Thank you. I think that's okay. it on my side. Okay, next I have Simon Ma. Hi, Jamie. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, loved hearing from it. You said that uh, the drive really for um, how far you got in Scotland and maybe that really kind of like pulled over into Wales, at least that's how I see it from the outside, but I'm not as, as deeply involved in that and in, in the UK, of course not. But um, and, and so... Uh, uh, and so what I find interesting is you said that um, you are more against large scale experiments. Uh, I find it really interesting because basically I'm um, working with the experts on Grand Common in Germany and they exactly want to do that. They want to even do a larger experiment, not a larger experiment than 70,000, but they want to test uh, 10,000 subjects in different places in Germany. So that is a large scale experiment. Um, and I, that's why I love the experiment because it's big and you have different places of you know data and all that. So I find it really interesting, but I would love to to just have you take a bit more on why you actually disagree with it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very much within a, a Scottish context. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it's because it feels we've taken the discussion to a different place. Okay. So I think experimentation is incredibly useful when you are either having to find the, the kind of data or the evidence to bring decision makers with you who are resistant in your own context or who perhaps are dismissive of what's been learned elsewhere or need to see it within you know, a German context as opposed to coming from, from somewhere else. And of course, there's no doubting that each national, indeed each local and regional context can be very different. And it, it, you know, there's always fascinating research to come out of that. I think the issue for me in Scotland, and as I say, there's others in the basic income movement who would disagree with me. They feel that uh, experimentation helps us to justify the support that we already have in a, in a sense. But for me, it's about the diversion of energy and finances into experiments that in a Scottish context, I'm not sure what they would add to us that we can't already access. And that we have a political context in Scotland 
that is a bit more willing to accept evidence from other countries. So, you know, we, we talked about the Finnish experiment. Scotland as a nation traditionally, and particularly our politicians are quite obsessed with Finland and, and see it as kind of the, the perfection of human civilization. So the idea that it's been tested in Finland can actually be seen as quite a positive correlation, we would like to think in Scotland. So for me, it's about the Scottish context. I'm not opposed to, to experimentation in, in principle, but I think it's where we see the need and the drive now is more about what does the policy look like in practice? And that's where I think the stories and, and almost the, the kind of qualitative evidence starts to become quite useful. How do we start to see how people would use this uh, and, and see a difference? I think the other thing that I found that was really interesting in, in a Scottish context, and this partly relates to where the UK is uh, politically and Scotland is, I mentioned the constitution obviously being quite a, a fault line. But I think one of the things that the basic income stood at has been quite different to other policy areas was that people, we were giving people chance to take their time with the idea. So what I find with a lot of policy discussion just now in Scotland and the UK is we say, here's an idea, are you for it or are you against it? And then that's you set, you don't, you don't give country, you put in your camps and you don't talk again. Whereas we were, uh, we've been trying through a lot of our engagement, many other partners as well, to say to people, here's an idea, play with it. What are the things that could be good? What are the things that might be a challenge? What else needs to be with it to support it? And I think that again plays that power within a Scottish context of the kind of qualitative learning within that. Actually, people who could sit in a room and go, uh, by and large, I find in most of my public engagement in Scotland that we start from a genuinely quite positive place. Most people are quite open to the idea. However, you always, of course, quite rightly have people who are opposed. You give them time and actually, although they may have reservations about these areas, they can imagine some good things that could be used with it uh, and vice versa. So I think, again, it's about finding that what is it that we need for the political discussion in Scotland to take it forward? I think it's less the data at this point and more the, uh, the storytelling. And that's why, for me, the energy and the finances could be better put into shorter, you know, less intensive ways to pick up on some of that, rather than if we're going to do a three and a half year, four year, multi-million pound, you know, huge experiment, then that's the discussion for the next five years at least. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Uh, that's really about the political discussion because I, I see it being quite different in Germany. First of all, you said that people are more um, generally open. That is really not the case. And it does have that feeling in Germany, at least, is that if we have more uh, scientific ideas that we have, if they have better research and if you have it more structured, um, then it would move forward. And interesting enough is the most substantiated uh, research on it is actually against it so it's actually interesting that um that it this is really a uh, an interesting and important discussion still to be held and so that actually makes it more applicable then yeah yeah and don't get me wrong uh if, if hopefully you know the, the german experiment goes ahead we will happily use the data that comes out of it uh so you know, welcome we're <laughs> off everybody else so you know yeah, exactly yeah. yeah but thank you for elaborating on it that was very helpful thanks Okay. Um, yeah, I, I have a few questions as well. Um, the how does the difference between the political center in Scotland and the political center in the UK as a whole, the the limits of what the Scottish Parliament can and can't do, uh, how does this affect the 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 UBI debate in Scotland, which seems to be going on largely in isolation? from what UBI debate there is in the UK as a whole? Yeah, well, I mean, it's definitely the, one of the biggest barriers we face in terms of any taking it forward. As it stands, Scotland cannot introduce either a basic income as a policy or the, um, even the, the large scale experiments we said, the interaction with the, the benefit system would require UK government involvement. What I think is starting to happen that's quite interesting, so the Welsh experiment that I mentioned is a really good example of this. Uh, and it's where I think the Scottish government could be doing more, is around recognising, well, okay, how do you start to implement or check some of these things under what you have already? So the Welsh government experiment, for example, is actually going to be paying quite a high level of income to the young people participating because they're mitigating what they will lose out on in UK government funding. So the Welsh government has actively said, 
we will use some of our budgets because these young people who receive the, the sort of basic income, obviously it's not fully a basic income, uh, will actually lose out some of the other UK benefits that they would be entitled to. So we'll top up from that. So that's the Welsh government choosing to use aspects of its budget to be able to deliver some of this change. I think the risk we've had in Scotland is that in one sense, it's relatively easy to support a policy that you can implement. You know, it's, it's great to be able to say, I would introduce this tomorrow if you know that tomorrow you're not going to be able to do it. Uh, so I think it's about seeing some of those practical steps. It's why I think the, the current standing, although it needs challenged and pushed on around minimum income guarantee, at least recognizes some steps forward. I think where perhaps there's now more of a debate around partial or incremental approaches to big, basic income have started to pick up more interest. So could you start to introduce it for, you know, so young people leaving the care system in Scotland largely fall under the Scottish government's control. Could you reshape the money and support they get into a basic income? It wouldn't be universal, but at least it would be a step forward with the, the concept. So I think there's more of a discussion now shaped by the, the UK government's kind of pushback on, uh, on seeing where that could, could be taken incrementally in Scotland. The only other thing we'd say, and, and in some ways, and not getting into kind of party political stances, but one of my concerns uh, on a UK level is I think it's entirely possible you could see a UK government quite rapidly jump to support of a basic income. And the reasoning for that would be that uh, universal credit, the system that's in place just now, uh, is under major strain. Uh, the National Audit Office has said it will never be able to achieve what it's set up to achieve, that it's failing under many levels. To get to a system where you could see that social security system collapsing and actually a, a UK government deciding that basic income was a, a popular way to respond to that, however, could lead to an introduction of either quite a, a knee-jerk basic income or indeed one that came more from a, a more right-wing libertarian perspective given some of the, the kind of senior folk within the UK government just now. So I think there's still discussion. There's more discussion behind the scenes than there is publicly. Uh, on a UK level, but I think that incremental change is probably where some of the aspects are being looked at, alongside connecting it to the bigger constitutional discussion. Yeah, I want to get in on this thing that you said about uh, about it's it's easy to support a policy that you that uh, you have no power to implement. Uh, this gets back to that first question that. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm pronouncing this wrong. Uh, Shamsadin uh, Amanov asked uh, of the other participants, I think this question is getting more and more relevant, where, where he says, how do you deal with insincere promises regarding basic income by politician parties to gain more votes? And it's not even necessarily insincerity, uh, but it can just be the ease. It is really easy to support UBI, if you have no power to, uh, uh, to if everybody knows that you, you're, you're, you don't have the power to deliver on it. Yeah. Uh, once you try to deliver on it, it becomes, you realize it's, it, this is a very difficult, expensive policy. It's not easy to deliver on. You have to be, make it a, a real priority and you have to get a, you have to get a uh, controlling interest in the government to, to side with you. Uh, I think this would be a great study for um, some political scientist to do, to look around the world or various countries or whatever and look, out, look at um, how far a politician is from actual national power uh, and, and, and regress their support for UBI. Is it negatively correlated with how close they are yeah. to actually being in power? Uh, we have that in the United States. We have uh, we had uh, in the last election a, a decent number of candidates for the House of Representatives uh, who endorsed basic income, uh, and almost all of them were very liberal people running in very conservative districts who knew they were going to lose. Yeah. We also had Hillary Clinton said after the 2016 election, "Well, if I knew I was going to lose, maybe I would have just uh, endorsed basic income." <laughs> I don't know who that was supposed to do any good for. Uh, but we also have in the U.S. and Canada, we have this large movement of mayors for basic income. Uh, for It started in Canada actually about a half a dozen years ago or more, and it spread to the United States recently. And some of them are putting their money where their mouth is funding experiments, but nobody expects that a mayor can actually introduce a true, a true universal basic income. And this all really, I think, connects with Scotland. 
because in Scotland, it's, it's in one sense, it's a national parliament, but in another sense, it's not a national parliament. Um, and you can have people say, well, well, UBI is one reason we need Scottish independence, so we can get UBI. But it could be a lot of these politicians are supporting UBI until independence. And then, well, as long as I'm for UBI and independence, as long as we don't have independence, uh, then everything starts over and then forget UBI. Um, I remember a lot of revolutionary leaders promising how progressive everything was going to get after the revolution um, and then not delivering after the revolution. Uh, I'm not going to name any countries. You can, uh, uh, I guess, all might be a, yeah. one way to put it. But uh, no, uh, I, I don't know. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Is this, I mean, is is this perception that it's, it's it's not UBI as soon as we get independence, but I support UBI until we get independence. So I, I, I think there's no doubting there's always aspects of that. Of course, yeah. if something's popular and progressive and, you know, makes you look quite, you know, quite interesting, uh, I think that can, can play into it. I think there's a couple of things I would say that maybe in a Scottish context offer hope. We can't guarantee at this stage that it's anything but hope, but offer hope uh, around that. So one is the change in attitude towards basic income over those years. So when I first was speaking to, you know, members of the Scottish government, senior Scottish government, civil servants and others about basic income, the response you would get from people is, yeah, we, we like the idea. And in an independent Scotland, we would consider looking at it. Um, mm -hmm. I would say to them, well, that's grand, but putting aside whether Scotland was ever independent or not, that would be a generation before you would even consider it. You're not going to yeah. suddenly, you know, gain independence and then be like hey let's try something we know nothing about you would mm -hmm. you you know the argument would be let's establish and, and change and the response to that was partly where we saw the growth around the feasibility study around work that's been taken uh, you know undertaken by Scottish government and others by reaching out and participating and you know being congresses and, and learning and bringing people to Scotland was a recognition that actually if this is a realistic goal and policy it needs work now and I think that is a positive that doesn't guarantee it would happen, but shows us that at least it has been taken seriously because the work has been put in now that it could be a realistic policy discussion for what an independent. So it wouldn't be let's get independent and then introduce basic income. I, I suggest it would probably be that a campaign would say part of a basic income, part of an independent Scotland would be a basic income. The other one that I think is it's changed it now it goes back to a little bit about everybody wants to be fashionable around exciting new policies and scotland is a generally progressive political country so therefore it's a lot easier for you all just to kind of agree on things um but because basic income is getting embedded with these other ideas of social policy change community wealth building four-day working week you know uh, new models of the economy whether it's well-being alliance whatever it's it's seen as part of a package and so therefore it's not just a, a tick box here's a policy that sounds quite nice. It's more seen as part of a wider conceptualization of Scotland as an economy and society. Again, doesn't guarantee, and I, I love your idea of the study about probably, yes, the closer you get to power, the, the further away the support goes. But I think at least the context is very different recently in Scotland in terms of that political discussion. Uh, and I think that at least gives a hope that there's a, a more significant uh, grouping of people who think you know at the end of the day regardless of where you stand in scotland's constitutional future uh you know scottish government uh politicians hope and want to be part of a, an independent scotland and governing that country so they they're talking about things they actually want to be able to put into to power at some point so i think there is a different mm -hmm. context at least to, to some of the u.s uh, examples you give mm -hmm. yeah uh yeah I, I i was prompted along these thinkings of quite some time ago um, I, I seem to remember a long time ago, uh, maybe it was in the, the, in the 20th century, definitely, maybe in the 80s, is that I think it was in Germany, maybe the Netherlands, where the Green Party uh, supported basic income for years and years. It was in its platform. And then they, the Green Party got bigger and they were, uh, had an opportunity that they might get into a ruling coalition. And then they dropped basic income from, from their platform and it never came back. Uh, I, uh, I can't remember, I can't remember the exact facts of that. Was that, was that Germany? Was that somewhere? 
but these yeah i'm i'm worried about this 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 type of thing happening even if it's it doesn't have to be uh, from insincerity but the, oh. the political difficulties and realities when you get close to power of actually making a huge change like this absolutely and i think that shows where that drive for basic income in scotland having come from with the formal party political system <coughs> i think remains crucial i think also you can look at for example in the republic of ireland just now with the work that's been done there around the the kind of trial of a form of basic income for, mm -hmm. for people in the, the creative arts uh, sector now you can challenge how you know the, the, the nature of the the pilots and everything else but that has still seen at least that coming through a coalition and governmental agreement supported through manifesto and, and taken into that so i think there's there's at least <coughs> examples where it's starting to, to come forward but i i mean certainly it's, it's definitely one you can't get complacent about because i think uh, again the the issue is from my perspective with basic income we are constitutionally neutral so we also don't want it to be seen as it's solely an independence idea because if scottish independence doesn't happen doesn't proceed ironically can't just now because it requires uk government involvement as well then you don't want the policy to be lost because it seems to have been bound to one constitutional outcome rather than about right. wider changes to its policy so i think keeping that balance going as well is a really critical one because it allows for Again, maybe incremental change uh, if the UK was to devolve more powers or opportunities, uh, which, you know, the last UK government, uh, the, the election that, that Jeremy Corbyn lost uh, as Labour, the leader, leader of the Labour Party in the UK, um, you know, the, had they achieved power, they would have, uh, they were looking to support basic income pilots across the north of England and by extension pilots in Scotland and Wales. So, you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that political changes could see more interest or support yeah. on the UK level. Oh, by the way, when I talk about the mayors for basic income, uh, I don't want to give any impression. I think that this support, their support is insincere. I think it's also one of the issues there is that the, the mayors, in, especially in the United States, tend to be more representative of marginalized communities and communities that are marginalized at the federal level. Yeah. Um, so their support, uh, they're, they're just simply, rep, they're, they're simply representing a community that's going to be more open to an idea like this. Absolutely. Um, and, and to be honest, I would say it's, it's mayors are probably doing most of the exciting political stuff in the US just now. I mean, we've certainly found in yeah. on a Scottish level, your engagements with places, not with federal government, you know, uh, mm -hmm. as, as everyone will know, you've, you've struggled with the kind of uh, the, 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 the way that federal government has been stuck for so long and that states have become so polarised. But actually cities are doing some, some really interesting. I think that role of mayors mm -hmm is one to be celebrated, albeit they can't implement policy on a, on a national level. Yeah. And, and one thing people, a lot of people don't know is that the power of a mayor around the United States greatly, greatly varies. And it's, it's uh, it, in some state, it, well, it's, it's, it's all dependent on what the rules at the state level are for mayor's power. And in some states, they can just change that at their whim, <laughs> add or remove, uh, add or remove powers from mayors. Uh, and, but it, it is great that some mayors are actually managing to wade through all that. And they're often very dependent on state funding for a lot of things and federal funding, but they're still able to wade through that to do anything good at all. Um, a lot of mayors, yeah, they're doing great work. Now, I wanna get back to this thing. Another thing that you said in your presentation, it's gonna be hard for a lot of us who haven't been following the ins and outs of Scottish UK politics, that it's, somehow easier for uh, a non-independent Scotland to introduce a minimum income guarantee or a basic income guarantee or negative income tax, whatever you want to call it, than a true universal basic income without becoming independent. Uh, how does that work uh, constitutionally? Why, why is it different? So largely, I suppose, because a minimum income guarantee, at least with, because I know, again, it's the usual joy of different terms being used in different places. So I know, for example, in the US, minimum income guarantees used a lot more in kind of more of a basic income approach as opposed to, to Scotland, where it's probably more akin to kind of almost a, a kind of living wage income level. So it's about setting that, that minimum you can't go below. So therefore, it requires less involvement with the social security system. So to introduce a basic income, in, in Scotland, certainly the majority of models have talked about rolling a lot of existing social security into the basic income to help pay for it. Uh, if you don't control that money, then you can't roll it into the, the payment of a basic income. So you would end up with it topping up 
or contradicting or going against uh, UK level benefits. Excuse me, a minimum income guarantee in the same way that Scotland can control a living wage or a minimum wage level. Um, it comes much more under the remit of Scottish government who do have some tax raising and varying powers. Um, so for example, in Scotland, higher rates, taxpayers pay a slightly higher rate of tax than the rest of the United Kingdom because the Scottish government chose to not introduce tax cuts that were carried out in the UK level. So they have a bit more control around some of those kind of baseline uh, taxation and, and, and economic measures. It's once you're getting into that wider social security system that it becomes harder to, to do that in a way that wouldn't uh, negatively impact or get out of control in terms of the finances available. Some of that will start to change because I say the, the Scottish government is taking over control over the next year or so of a bigger swathe of um, tax powers. So after the last Scottish independence referendum where Scotland voted to stay in the UK, there was a recognition that it wasn't exactly a resounding yes for the union. Uh, and so measures were taken to try and devolve further powers. So uh, one of those is around Social Security. So it will be interesting to see what measures within that, those devolved powers might be more applicable towards a, a basic income, uh, which is why if you were to get towards a more, and don't get me wrong, uh, we've touched on some of the challenges of federalism uh, that you, you've uh, just outlined there from a US context. You know, Scotland is a very centralised country within the UK, which is still quite a centralised country apart from certain parts of the, the north of England. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a long way to go that that could open up opportunities if Scotland did have more control over tax raising powers, borrowing powers or uh, or social security powers. Mm -hmm. And uh, how has, uh, uh, maybe I'm getting a little tangential here, but how has uh, you know, the, 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 the remain debate was, was, was when they voted remain was so close but then, um, then a few years later, you have this Brexit vote where the vote in Scotland is overwhelming for remain within, within uh, the EU and, of course, the UK as a whole, thanks to, uh, thanks to mostly to England, um, uh, and, and, and thanks mostly to England, votes to leave the UK. How is that affected when you have all these Scots a majority, a substantial majority of Scots would rather be in the EU. How does that affect uh, uh, the Scottish independence vote and all this and all these other aspects of of uh, Scottish politics, including for base games? Well, I mean, it, it certainly saw a significant bounce for quite a period of time. The polling suggested that if there was a referendum, Scotland would vote yes to independence, um, and and that was held consistently, but it's dropped off more recently. I think is the mm -hmm. due to the pandemic and starting to move out of it. Uh, I think one of the things that you've you've seen a real uh, interest at two levels. One is that I know, uh, and this is you know anecdotal rather than data driven, but I know anecdotally and there has been suggestions from polling that uh, there were. There's a kind of core of people who will always vote no to independence and a core of people who will always vote yes to independence and then the majority in the middle who, who are open to interpretation. And the idea was that in 2014, uh, the case for independence wasn't made in a way that was convincing enough, yet mm -hmm. the case for the union was so poorly put together that it was almost to the point where, you know, the yes campaign managed to win. And this is partly why there's interest in things like basic income providing more depth and uh, you know, reasoning behind why you would vote for Scotland to, to be independent. But there also was a feeling at the time that a significant proportion of people voted no to independence because at that point, the question, the suggestion was that Scotland would have had to have left the EU, even if it was temporarily, because the UK would have been the remainder, the, the continuation states, and Scotland would have had to have left and reapplied. And you can debate whether that would have been a quick process or not, but that did concern people who didn't want to leave the, the EU. Brexit changed that because suddenly you had Scotland feeling it was being taken out of the EU uh, against its wishes and a, a resistance from the UK government to see the ability of, for example, varying tax, uh, varying immigration policies uh, for, for Scotland. I think, so I, I certainly, as I say anecdotally, I know quite a number of people who voted no on the basis of, of EU membership, now more open to the idea of yes on the basis of potential EU membership. I think, interestingly, from a policy and campaigning perspective, uh, what you're starting to see as well is uh, a kind of more continual reference to Scottish independence as Skexit. So instead of Brexit, you've got Skexit. And I think that's a very deliberate uh, and, and quite smart, probably, campaigning tool from the pro-union side of trying to, to link the kind of idea of Scottish independence being 
just another form of Brexit and, and your kind of populism and, and small scale. And I mean, if we do have a second referendum, what's fascinating is you will have had a load of people who were supportive of the EU and had argued that being in union is a positive thing, so, you know, arguing against being in a union anymore. While another group of people who'd argued that unions are terrible and you need freedom from them for, for Brexit suddenly saying that unions right. are the best thing in the world. So I think it's yeah. going to be a very messy and, uh, and hard to predict uh, debate over the next couple of years at this stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they could have a, a combined uh, a Skexit and Skentrance campaign <laughs> at the same time. Exactly. We're going to Skexit Britain and we're going to Skenter uh, the EU. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's, uh, there's, you know, there's tangential, but there's some really interesting debates going on around actually, you know, one of the reasons the UK left uh, the EU is because nobody really, you know, there was never a case made for the EU strongly enough. We took for granted potential benefits. Yeah. So actually, would an independent Scotland, rather than instantly applying for the EU, take time to decide what a relationship with the EU would look like? I think there's some, some fascinating mm -hmm. spaces there around nation building and conceptualization of countries in, in the modern world. But yeah, I mean, I think things like, there, there's no doubting it's something like uh, Ukraine can play out in both directions. It kind of might provide a bit of reassurance of being part of the United Kingdom uh, in the face, mm -hmm. face of you know potential global uncertainty then the EU does that offer a, a kind of space as well so uh, I, I think at this stage it's definitely open for uh, for going in either direction yeah yeah well it's it's gonna be it, it, yeah exciting to see what 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 comes out um, and uh, all right well we are out of time thanks a lot thanks a lot Jamie for this discussion it's really interesting what's going on there and uh, I think it, it is also with you know even with all the complications that we've talked about, given that you've got so many parties that at parties that are, you know, major parties in Scotland really interested in this, it makes, I think, Scotland one of the most exciting places for the UBI movement now. Uh, really disappointed that COVID ruined our chance to, to actually come to Scotland for the BN conference. Yeah. But uh, we'll, we'll get you back over. Uh, soon. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to come. All right. All right. Good talking to you, Jamie, and uh, I'll see you later. Goodbye, everybody, for the Freebus 